Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone. I, I will say, if you're a leader in a faith community and a member of your youth group comes and says, I want my rock band to play at my church, you say yes. <laughs> it's really wonderful. Um, and they're good. So, so first of all, thank you so much for being here. My name is Mike Kinman. My pronouns are he, him. I'm the rector, the senior pastor uh, here at All Saints Church. Um, it, is, it just fills my heart to see this place so full. Um, and we are in such a difficult time. And I feel like we've been saying that more and more for the past three years, and it just keeps getting uh, more and more difficult. And as, as we have gone through these last several months, um, I've been guided by, first of all, the hope. And by hope, I don't mean, gee, I hope so, but the sure and certain hope that Islam is a religion of peace and Judaism is a religion of peace and Christianity is a religion of peace. And there is ground of peace on which we all stand together and we can stand together. I'm reminded of Dr. King's words that violence only begets violence, adding further darkness to a night already devoid of stars. And that is why we at All Saints Church are calling for a ceasefire and the release of all hostages in Gaza because all that is happening right now is violence is begetting more violence. Children are dying, families are being separated, and trauma is leading us into more trauma. And I'm also reminded of something else Dr. King said, which is he said, a riot is the language of the unheard. And sometimes we resort to violence when we have been shouting and no one has been listening to us. And so, it is not enough that we call for a ceasefire. We need to listen deeply to each other. We need to understand each other, each other's history, each other's narratives, each other's passion, each other's pain. And so I was thrilled when Salam, you came to me and asked if All Saints would host this wonderful event, the Islamic Narrative on Jerusalem uh, and Palestine because there has not been a lot of listening to this narrative. And we need to hear, we need to understand, we need to understand how we can sit with each other, not just in this crisis moment, but for the time to come. And we're looking forward in early 2024 to having another event. We're gathering some really wonderful progressive Jewish leaders in this city. Um, and we're going to do another session of deep listening. Um, you know, the, the easy soundbite narratives, those aren't hard to find. They're all over the internet. They're generally caricatures, and I find them very unhelpful. What you're going to get today is an in-depth narrative. And I just, I, I, I urge all of us not just to open our ears and our minds, but our hearts. Um, and to sit with and, and deeply appreciate the people who are here opening up their stories for us to hear. So I'm definitely not the person you came here to see and hear. And so uh, can we, first of all, welcome and give thanks to Salam al Mariati, the founder and co-president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And Salam, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. I, I'm so glad to be back at my church. This is a, a place I call home uh, ever since 1991. Uh, in the first Gulf War, it was Reverend George Regas that uh, opened the hearts of All Saints Church to people seeking peace. Uh, and then Reverend Ed Bacon, and now uh, very, very proud to stand alongside uh, the rector of All Saints, uh, Reverend Mike Kinman, who has been uh, please give him a hand. Who's, who's been con continuing this legacy uh, with grace and with intelligence and, and with great leadership. Um, I'm going to get right to the speakers because we came to, to listen to them. Um, and as Mike said, we need to 
listen to different narratives. And there's some things you will hear today that you may not agree with. Uh, there's some things that um, you will maybe even find uh, uh, a lot of differences of opinion uh, throughout the world. The, the main point is that this is unheard in America. It is unseen. It is even unwritten. Uh, it is not in our history textbooks. The history textbooks call this the Dark Ages. Uh, and that's because Europe was going through the Dark Ages. Uh, while um, Islam was leading the civilization. And so to understand relations with Christians and Jews as part of Islamic civilization is important. And when I say Islamic civilization, it's not necessarily a religious issue. It's not theological necessarily, although it has theological underpinnings. But it is mainly the social understanding and the political authority between the 8th and 19th centuries. And to understand uh, the dynamics of that, I think, will help us as peacemakers will help us understand these dual narratives, maybe even more than two narratives, as we approach uh, the issue of the Middle East that has been uh, troubling us for quite some time. So with that, let me just get right to our, our first uh, panelist. Um, he is uh, Munir Sheikh. He's the vice president of Bayan College, which produces a lot of chaplains uh, that are trained here in America, not trained in the Middle East, but having that American Muslim understanding, identity, and orientation. And he's also a professor of history, and he, he's going to cover the early Islamic history on Jerusalem and Palestine. Good day, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here, and uh, thank you to MPAC and All Saints Church for hosting this gathering. I'm gonna to try to provide you a summary of uh, Islamic history and the relationship that Muslims have with the, the region of Palestine in 15 minutes, <laughs> which, you know, should take no less than three hours in actuality if this were, you know, in a university uh, classroom. Uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, I've also uh, shared a QR code and link for those of you who'd like to pull up the slides for future reference. Uh, in case it's of interest to you. But uh, really hoping to provide you a little bit of a framework from an academic standpoint, but also uh, an Islamic perspective on uh, the history of the region since the time of the rise of, the, uh, of, us, of Islam. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the, the prophet, the last prophet in the Islamic tradition is Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who was born in 570 CE. And, was called to a mission to preach uh, monotheism starting in 610. And it was a 22, 23 year journey that he went through in advocating for people in Arabia, particularly to come back to the, the roots of their faith tradition, which was monotheism, the roots that are represented by the structure of the Kaaba that you see here on the slide. Uh, the mountain that you see in the, in the image is the, the location of the very first revelation that took place when the angel Gabriel, according to Islamic tradition, came to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and announced to him that he was going to be given this mission of uh, transmitting the word of God and bringing people back in a more sort of universal framework uh, to a religion uh, of worshiping of the one God. And there are many aspects of his life. Uh, we won't you know, go through all of the d details of uh, his experiences uh, as a prophet, uh, but there are certain key uh, developments that took place in his lifetime that relate to uh, the area of Palestine and the, the location of Jerusalem in particular. In 619 CE, for example, he had an experience called the night journey. And we can move to the second slide and I'll say a bit about that. Um, so, in the Islamic tradition, this is known as a miraculous event that took place within one night. In a single night in 619, the prophet was taken on a, on a steed, essentially, a winged steed that is known as Burak in the Islamic tradition, to a location that the Quran describes as the farthest mosque. So, the mosque that's... Uh, uh, the original house of worship, according to Islamic tradition, would be the Kaaba, which you saw on the previous slide. That house is believed to have been constructed by Abraham and his son Ismail. So that is kind of the uh, original house, and then, or the original mosque or place of worship, and the farthest mosque 
from their perspective in Arabia was the mosque or the location, the holy site in Jerusalem, which is also referred to as Al-Quds in, in Arabic. So that location of the farthest, the farthest mosque is the Aqsa Mosque, and hence uh, the name given to that mosque subsequently as it was constructed in the early Islamic empire. So in the time that Muhammad was preaching, for a good portion of that time, the Muslim community around him in Mecca and then even in Medina, once they moved there, they prayed facing Jerusalem. So they had this sense of a, a connection to that land and a connection to the story of Abraham and the, uh, the other prophets that are predecessors of the prophet Muhammad and the site of Jerusalem being very special and holy. At that time, the Mecca had been, uh, the, the Kaaba in Mecca had uh, hundreds of deities that the, the Arab tribes had brought to the Kaaba and housed there, and they were performing pilgr pilgrimages there on an annual basis. So later on, towards the end of the prophet's life, he was able to return to Mecca, and he was able to clear out all of those deities and idols, and then rededicate the Kaaba as the house of the one God, or Allah in Arabic. So while this was still transpiring, the early Muslim community actually were, were praying in the direction of Jerusalem. I think that's worth noting. Um, and also in relation to this event, the Isra and Miraj, the prophet uh, is believed to have led all of the other prophets, essentially in spirit, in prayer. Uh, and this is again part of the sacred history of Islam that positions the prophet Muhammad as the final prophet, as the seal of the prophets, but also as a, a brother of all of the other prophets. In his own words, Muhammad describes himself as the final brick that goes into the edifice or the wall of prophethood. So it's not that the prophet Muhammad is purely distinct and elevated relative to the other prophets, but the Quran even indicates to Muslims, to the believers that all of the prophets are essentially uh, uh, brothers to one another and committed to the same ultimate mission. We'll move on to the next slide. The Prophet Muhammad passed away in 632 CE uh, after that mission of 22 or 23 years. And he was succeeded in uh, leadership of the community, not as a prophetic figure, but as a responsible steward of the community by a number of his companions. And this is the list of the first four stewards or caliphs, as they're called, uh, successors of the Prophet. Uh, who led the community through various challenges that they faced as a, as a fledgling polity in Medina. Uh, Abu Bakr, who was a companion of the Prophet and one of the early supporters of, of him in Mecca, uh, became the first of these caliphs. He was selected by a council of Meccan and Medinan Muslims, uh, tribal leaders, as that successor. And he faced some challenges uh, within the community, some people who wanted to break away and no longer pay the zakat tax and other things, and he basically kept the community together. And then uh, after his passing away in two years, he was succeeded by another very important companion of the Prophet named Umar, who was from a, 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 a family that was uh, honored in, in Mecca, uh, along with some of the other families, and uh, during his time, the Muslim community uh, expanded the control of territory. Uh, they fought various forces of the Byzantines and the Sasanid Persians, and they defeated them in various battles. And they were steadily able to take control of parts of Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Iraq, and, and so forth. So the Muslim community based in Medina was now sort of transforming itself into an, an empire of sorts. There was, there were, they were a religious community, but at the same time they were uh, gaining worldly authority over various subject populations. And this process continued under the other two caliphs. While this was happening, there were a variety of internal conflicts as well. We can't delve into that, but it's important to know that over time, uh, the Muslims continued to take control of formerly Byzantine and Sasanid territories. So this marked the end of the Persian dynasty or the Persian, uh, uh, Persian Empire and then the Byzantine Empire uh, 
much of their territory, especially Syria and Palestine, was taken over by the Muslims. Jerusalem itself was conquered in 638 by, uh, by Muslim forces, and I'll speak to that in a moment in a little bit more detail. But you can see in the next slide the, the extent of the Muslim empire in the time of the third caliph, Uthman. Uh, just prior to that. Okay, there we go. All right, sorry. Um, so again, you can see the, the shaded area is the extent of the empire, which is quite significant. Again, uh, the taking over the uh, regions of Iran and uh, further east that the Sasanids had controlled and much of North Africa. Uh, and so these became provinces of the fledgling Muslim empire, different regions that were governed by appointed governors uh, and you know, they were expected to uh, maintain the systems that were already in place uh, within the society at large under the Byzantines and the Sasanids, which was the agricultural base, right? The Muslim uh, policy at the time of these early caliphs was to be as minimally disruptive as possible to the um, agricultural and uh, uh, mercantile systems that were already in place. So while Muslim control is extending across these lands, the people who are living there remain Zoroastrian, remain Christian, remain Jewish, and so forth. Um, they were not expected to convert to Islam. In fact, the, the Umayyad dynasty, which I'll speak to in a moment, uh, did not prefer conversion. They preferred that the subject populations would continue to obviously pay, pay a poll tax, which was helpful for the empire, uh, but they did not expect that all of the population would convert to Islam. That was not something that they had as a, as a priority. Their interest, of course, was to maintain stability and control of those regions, uh, but they definitely did not uh, in any sort of uh, policy, uh, you know, expect that the local populations would convert. In fact, it took about 300 years since the time of the death of the prophet, 300 years from that before even 50% of the population of these regions had converted to Islam through intermarriage or through, you know, a desire for, uh, uh, you know, the appeal of the message of Islam or you know, relationships that they would have with various people to become part of, you know, the social structure of the, the, uh, the Muslim empire. Uh, let me say a bit more about um, the arrival of Omar, the second caliph, to Jerusalem. If we can pull up that slide. Caliph Omar's arrival to Jerusalem. It's, I think, a little ahead of this, prior to this. Um, before. There we go, okay. So some of you may know this, uh, this story is uh, recorded in a variety of historical sources that were produced uh, by Muslim historians. And it's also uh, supported by a number of external sources from uh, some of the uh, Syriac Christian uh, histories of the time. Uh, when the Muslim uh, armed forces reached Jerusalem, they, obviously surrounded the city, the bishop or the, the patriarch of uh, Jerusalem said that he would in fact surrender the city. You know, they weren't going to fight against uh, the Muslim forces. They were going to go ahead and uh, surrender the city. But he insisted that the caliph, he would only surrender the city to the, the leader of the Muslims, whoever that might be, the caliph in other words. So Umar, who was in Medina at the time, actually had to make a journey of several weeks in order to come to Jerusalem and receive the keys to the city from the bishop or the patriarch uh, before they would be formally uh, allowed to enter the city. So the Muslim forces were camped outside of the city. They waited for Omar and he uh, ultimately walked into the city and was invited by the patriarch, in fact, to make a prayer in the church of the Holy Sepulchre there. And Omar famously declined to do so because he was very cog cognizant of the fact that he might be inadvertently setting a precedent where, you know, Muslims could just kind of go and pray wherever they wanted to, disregarding sort of the property rights of the subject population. So he was careful not to do that, and he insisted on praying outside of the church. And then later on, uh, he and his companions, they, you know, surveying the city, they located the site of the 
the place where Muhammad had uh, had that experience of ascending uh, from from the holy site, which is also considered to be the site where the temples used to used to be. Uh, the the, Jew, the second Jewish temple had been destroyed in 70 CE by the Romans. For the I'm sure many of you know this history. And so since from 70 until 638, uh, that site became, uh, fell into disuse. And in fact, you know, a lot of time the, the trash from the city ended up sort of getting deposited there as just a site that was you know, no longer being utilized and because it had been destroyed. And so Umar ordered that that site be cleansed because they wanted to rededicate it, re-sanctify it as a holy place. And so they cleared out all of the detritus that had accumulated there and they made it a place of worship. So they wanted to restore its function as a, as a holy site, as a place of worship, which in the Islamic tradition, it's called the, the house, the holy house or the Bayt, Bayt al-Maqdis. So this is a kind of, you know, imagine a concentric circle, you know, from an Islamic perspective, Islam is kind of the outer concentric circle, but within that is, you know, the, the traditions of the prior prophets, the tradition of uh, Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, the traditions of Moses and Abraham and others, and their connection to that site. So Muslims feel at that time that they're doing something honorable by restoring its position as a holy site, not so much as a statement of appropriation, but as a statement of Let's make this site what it's meant to be, which is a, a channel or a connection to God. So that's, that's part of Umar's story in arriving at Jerusalem. He also makes a proclamation, a, an assurance um, to the, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And that assurance you can read in, in detail, if you can pull up that slide. It's also in the slides that are linked if you'd like to pull it up. But I'll read it really quickly. He says, of course, he starts in the name of God. This is the assurance of safety which the servant of God, Umar, the commander of the faithful, has given to the people of Ailea, which is what Jerusalem had been called. He has given them an assurance of safety for themselves, for their property, their churches, their crosses, the sick and healthy of the city, and for all the rituals which belong to their religion. Their churches will not be inhabited by Muslims and will not be destroyed. Neither they nor their land on which they stand, nor their cross, nor their property will be damaged. They will not be forcibly converted. And Jews will not live in Ailea with them. The people of Jerusalem must pay the taxes like the people of other cities and must, must expel the Byzantines and the robbers. And it goes on from there. Uh, the important thing to note here is it's an assurance that Omar is giving specifically to the Christian leaders of the city. So he's speaking to them because at that time it was essentially predominantly a, a city inhabited by Christians because Jews had been dispersed after the destruction of the temple. They were allowed to come periodically for certain um, feast days or holidays in, in their tradition, but generally the city was predominantly a Christian city at the time of the Muslim conquest. So in this assurance, Umar is speaking to the Christians. He's saying that the, the Christians should not expect that the Muslims will require when they were going to permit Jews to be able to come back into the city, but they would not require them to be living amidst the Christian community. Because in this time, in the Middle Ages, you know, people tended to want to live with their own type of people, right? The, they didn't have a sense of integrating different groups of people. So that was part of the assurance. But subsequently, and we can move on to the next slide, with regard to the Muslim policy towards uh, non-Muslims, there's a concept in the Quran called Ahl al-Kitab, which is people of the book, so Jews and Christians and others, eventually within Islamic law were considered people of the book. And the people of the book and other populations that might come under Muslim rule are known as people of the pact. People who, if they agreed to join the pact or agreed to the terms of the pact, they would be treated as subject populations with rights to maintain their properties, to maintain their religious traditions, to have uh, freedom of movement uh, and, and no um, in interference with their customs, uh, their established customs. So today, sometimes, you know, uh, amongst the alt-right, uh, the, the, the term vimmi is used as kind of a, 
uh, a kind of pejorative term and you know it's mischaracterized. But in, in the Middle Ages, this is actually quite remarkable because in the Byzantine world, you were supposed to be a Christian of the type that the Byzantines favored. Whatever the Byzantine emperor, whatever uh, flavor of Christianity at the time that he favored, the subjects were expected to adhere to that. Similarly, in the Sassanid Empire, you, you had to be Zoroastrian. If you were not, then if you were Persian and not Zoroastrian, then you could be persecuted. So there was this emphasis on the, the ruler and the population sharing the same faith tradition. In the Muslim Empire, because of certain principles within the Quran and certain practices that were established by Muhammad and the early caliphs, there wasn't that particular concern that the subject population must also practice Islam. Now, they were invited to do so by preachers and others, but they, it was not a governmental policy that they should do so. And hence, this structure of the Ahl al dhimma came about. And instead of paying poll taxes to the Byzantines of the Sassanids, yes, these subject populations paid poll taxes that were assessed uh, uh, upon them as part of the agreement. Um, so I'm going to just conclude here with uh, uh, the last slide, which will lead into the next presenter. We won't talk about the Umayyad dynasty, which uh, came about after the first four caliphs, uh, but um, we can move on to the next slide. This is an image of the Dome of the Rock, which was built in the Umayyad period. The Umayyads were the first dynasty of uh, rulers in Islam, a family rule, essentially, and they were later uh, uh, displaced by the Abbasids, but the Umayyads built this structure as a place to honor the site of the sacred rock where Muhammad is believed to have ascended to heaven during that miraculous event, and also in some traditions where Abraham had sacrificed his son or attempted to sacrifice his son in fulfillment of God's command, and, uh, which was you know, um, prevented by a miraculous substitution. Um, we can continue. And this is a broader picture, again, you can look it up in your slides, of the precincts where the Dome of the Rock is structured as, and as, as well as the Al-Aqsa Mosque that was built on the bottom edge of that um, complex. And uh, the last slide, I think, after this. So there were a number of ruling dynasties that came about thereafter, of course, during the Crusades. Uh, Crusaders, uh, for a period of time of about 90 years, controlled the city of Jerusalem. Salah al-Din, who was a famous Muslim Kurdish ruler, displaced uh, the Crusaders, defeated them in a battle, and uh, was able to re regain control of the city. Uh, and then since that point, essentially, various other dynasties continued to rule Jerusalem all the way until the Ottoman conquest of Syria and Palestine in 1517, and uh, until the 20th century, essentially, the Ottomans controlled the city. So. Uh, I'll leave it at that, and um, uh, thank you again for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Manir. I know that was a, a speed course in 10 centuries, but uh, I think you did an outstanding job. Uh, there's no quiz uh, at this point. And um, as, as Manir said, I, I believe you can download uh, the whole slide presentation. Um, and it's very uh, rich in information. We also have uh, Adam, who is going to be passing out index cards. So if you have questions on any of the material that was presented and, and subsequent presentations, go ahead and write your questions, and we'll try to get to them uh, after uh, the presentations are complete. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Fayez uh, Hamad, uh, who is a lecturer at USC Department of Political Science and International Relations, and he's going to cover the Ottoman era. Uh, in Ottoman Palestine. Hello. Thank you for being here, and I'm definitely happy to be among you today. Uh, today, I want to discuss the uh, late Ottoman period of, uh, over Palestine, and uh, particularly the last century of the Ottoman rule. Uh, and to, the hope is uh, for me to uh, outline uh, and discuss the dynamics uh, and developments uh, that uh, led the transformation of Palestine from a majority Arab country uh, into the creation of the state of Israel in 1948. Um, uh, so there'll be a discussion of uh, socio um, societal 
uh, political geostrategic conditions that gave rise to these conditions uh, to achieve the outcome that I, uh, we're discussing here. Uh, for um, a thousand or a thousand, uh, nearly 1,100 years, Palestine was uh, ruled by an Arab Muslim um, uh, regimes uh, or Muslim-led uh, uh, regimes uh, since the Muslim conquest in the seventh century. And to pick up from uh, where Munir had left, when the Ottomans uh, conquer Palestine in, in 1516, the Sultan Ottoman uh, Salim I entered Palestine on December 29th, 1915, excuse me, 1516, and he was presented with the Covenant of Omar that he was referenced, and he put it over his head as a sign of respect and his commitment to continue abiding by its uh, etiquettes. Uh, my goal here is to uh, first give you an idea of what Palestine was like in the late Ottoman period, and, um, and then uh, bring these dynamics that I have been uh, referencing, I referenced earlier. Uh, Palestine was um, <clears throat> uh, um, part of a, a governance, and the Ottomans have ruled over many governance within the Arab world and outside of it, and it was divided into different districts, or what the Ottomans called Sanjaks, and Jerusalem had uh, been always uh, allowed to rule with a direct reporting to the uh, Ottoman Sultan uh, in Constantinople, uh, giving its uh, religious significance to the Ottomans and to the Muslim community. Uh, so the Ottomans controlled over the Arab provinces uh, with more centralized uh, element than the outlying provinces beyond the Arab core of the Ottomans. And locally, uh, the Palestinians, uh, you know, affairs were led by the leading clans and prominent uh, families uh, to rule, you know, um, to control government activities and functions, collect taxes, maintain security. Uh, at a time when Palestine in the 19th century was entering or becoming part of the world economy. And at the time also when the Ottomans were invoking or uh, um, uh, deploying a set of reforms and restructurings giving the pressure that the Ottomans were feeling from the European great powers, which I will talk about in a minute. And these set of organizations were called the Tanzimat, reforms and restructuring elements. To zoom out, uh, you know, and discuss these larger dynamics. Uh, one uh, important theme to understand is what was called as the Eastern question. It's a question that was uh, contemplated by uh, European policymakers uh, and strategists on the question of what was going to happen to the Ottoman territories and domains at a time when the Ottomans facing decline vis-a-vis -vis the rising power of Europe. So the question for them, uh, and for Europe in particular, particularly Britain, it wanted to maintain European balance of power so as not to allow things to get out of hand where Britain would become at the losing end of that. So there was a balance act, so to speak, for uh, that long 19th century uh, in, uh, you know, globally. And there was a concept here that the Ottomans uh, have dealt with the great powers that was called capitulations. They had set up agreements that the Ottomans have granted the Europeans uh, you know, relaxed terms of trade, extraterritorial rights within the Ottoman domains, and they, was, they were giving to the Europeans from a position, through Ottomans' position of strength, to you know, as a good will and to encourage a trade. But uh, the the problem that the Europeans uh, were, or rather, the Ottomans were facing as the balance of power shifted away from them into the Europeans was the disadvantage or the, the, the attempt for, by the Europeans to abuse or misuse these agreements in the context of the, particularly the French-British rivalry, the internal integration of the Ottoman period uh, era, and also the Russian-Ottoman conflicts that took place for a long time. The second element that brought about the uh, changes that I, uh, I outlined earlier is the Egyptian uh, invasion and occupation of Palestine, which it was the control of which was under the Ottomans. So you know, the Muhammad Ali and his son, who were the governor of Egypt, challenged the Ottoman rule, drove up to Palestine, occupied it, and that era inaugurated what came to be known as the opening of the Holy Land uh, to, Euro to European political and religious and cultural penetration. Uh, in the, during this period, uh, the, the, the Egyptians wanted to appease the Europeans so as not to 
compelled their withdrawal as per the Eastern question that Britain and others were concerned about. And as a result, the Egyptians allowed the opening of European consulates in Palestine, beginning with the British one in 1838, Prussia, Sardinia, the French, Australia, and the US and the Spanish consulates. And uh, there was definitely, along these diplomatic efforts, an increased uh, public interest in Europe about the Holy Land. Uh, and the, this, uh, uh, the element or the point of entry for the Europeans where it came to be the protection of the non-Muslim minorities within the Ottoman Empire in general, but specifically in Palestine vis-a-vis -vis these changes. And these, uh, the, the religious activities and missionary activities became institutionalized under the Egyptian control of Palestine. And the influence uh, was, b b starting that point, began to increase in a significant manner. So the, what, we, what we could refer to as the European cultural religious penetration began with the <clears throat> French claiming the right for the protection of Catholics in Palestine and beyond. Russians, you know, they claimed protection over Orthodox Christians. And Britain was not to be left out, uh, began to look for uh, um, local uh, patrons and then hence settled or protection of Protestants and then the Jews. So each great power laid the claim over the protection of uh, the prospective Christian or uh, non-Muslim uh, religious groups in Palestine as a mechanism to increase their influence and penetration into the Ottoman domain. Uh, for example, the, uh, as a result of these uh, changes, we have the uh, Anglo-Prussian uh, Episcopal See in Jerusalem, which was building the, you know, the Protestant cathedral or Christian Christ uh, that was uh, ruled by alternation of bishops between Britain and Prussia. Uh, and then uh, as a result of, these, of all of these changes, we have uh, now increased calls and petitions in Europe uh, you know, among the publics for the opportunity to build Christian imperial state in Palestine. And uh, the, uh, the Holy Land began to, be, uh, to assume a special role among Europeans in that European foreign policies began to be centered around the concept of Holy Land and the protection of non-Muslims. Um, <clears throat> the theme was that no European power dreamed of having an exclusive control. The understanding was that there will be some internationalized presence of the different European powers in Palestine, but that, of course, came to change. And then with all of these developments and changes, we have a massive increase in interest for reconquest, colonization, and territorial claims of Palestine by Europeans. Then another concept in the context of these political, cultural shifts and changes, the concept or the ideology of doctrine of restoration of the Jews uh, which uh, offered an ideological legitimization, uh, first infused by the Anglican uh, Kiliastic, by the Anglican Messianism and Evangelism, the idea the last day of judgment is linked to the restoration of Jews who need to be ingathered in Palestine and accept uh, the Christian gospel, which is a prerequisite for the advent of the kingdom of Christ, and hence the Jews at that process will be us will be converted into Christianity. The only debate among Europeans, particularly Britain, was whether the Jews need to be converted before their restoration or once they're restored. Uh, so this restoration idea became actually a, a rose to the level of foreign policies of Europeans trying to convince the Sultan uh, of the Ottoman Empire to, to allow the Jews to return to Palestine. Um, and during the 19th century, there were plenty of crises, uh, you know, diplomatic nature, whether it was the Egyptian occupation of Palestine and Syria, the Europeans' attempt to eject the, European, the Egyptians, 1830, 1840, you have the Crimean War, you have the uh, Berlin uh, uh, Conference, and in each of these, you saw in Europe a rise of what seemed to be called the signs of the time, seizing these uh, uh, Eastern crisis to talk about the restoration of Jews in Palestine uh, to, the Palest to Palestine. And even without this uh, biblical restoration need, there was still uh, a wider belief that Palestine was God-given home for the Jews, and it became an essential component of the British understanding of Palestine itself. So the, all of these elements uh, served as rationale uh, justification for what was to come. 
late 19th century, or actually for much longer than that, uh, Europe was, uh, of course, had been facing um, or producing anti-Semitism, uh, and there was hence the rise of the Jewish question. Europeans were asking what to do with the Jews who ultimately do not belong to the West, because they actually belong to the East, and therefore uh, the idea is, was to restore the Jews to their rightful place in the East, that's one objective, and the other one is to facilitate the departure of Jews from Europe, giving the anti-Semitic, the deep-seated uh, deep anti-Semitic element in Europe. And hence, these elements co co coincided or converged with the emerging British imperialist designs, and hence Zionism became the solution for all these different problems, and the convergence of the interest of the Zionist movement with those of British imperialism, and as a result, restoration was linked to colonization project, and they were both linked to the goals of Zionism, and then you have World War I, which ultimately produced, as a result of all of these developments and dynamics, in, uh, 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 the result of that was the Balfour Declaration when Britain promised uh, that Palestine should be the Jewish homeland, uh, and that uh, resolution or declaration was issued in November 2nd, 1917. A mere two weeks later after that, uh, Britain conquer, you know, conquered Jerusalem, and um, a, a General, uh, me, General uh, al Nabi uh, gave, or in, in working with the dictate or the request of the Britain Prime Minister, uh, that Br Palestine need to be delivered by Christmas for, as a Christmas gift for the British people. Uh, the, the takeaway I would like you to begin with is that the indisputable or the indispensable role of the great powers in these developments, and up to that point it has been the role of the great, great Britain uh, in this uh, effort, and of course the delivery of Palestine as a Christmas uh, gift to the British people meant or entailed the fulfillment of the Balfour Declaration, from gift to the British people, gift to the Jews and to the Zionists, and um, since World War II, uh, to allow me to end my presentation here, uh, it has been the United States that has been assuming the instrumental and indisputed role in the, in the conflict. And uh, allow me to finish by saying, in this uh, uh, season of Christmas and December, December seemed to be a, a, a month of events in this conflict, um, the United States has the power uh, to call uh, for an immediate ceasefire and relief for the beleaguered population of Gaza, and it has the power to begin in a serious manner uh, the resolution of the conflict based on equality and other universal values to both Jews and Palestinians in the Holy Land. Thank you. Thank you, Paez. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna now show a film um, that really, uh, in, in, in my opinion, is it re represents the seminal moment in terms of the modern conflict. Uh, and this is a film about the uh, Belfour Project. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Bahatut for recommending this to us. It's, it's a short film, um, and it describes what happened uh, between World War I and, uh, and, uh, and 1948. So we're going to watch that film right now. Between 1917 and 1948, Britain controlled the area of the Middle East, then known as Palestine. This chapter of history was to have a profound effect on both Arabs and Jews. Yet most British people know little about it. This film is a simple outline of a very complex story. So what took Britain to Palestine in the first place? For centuries, the region had been ruled by the Ottoman Turks. But when the First World War broke out in 1914, the Turks allied with Britain's enemies, Germany, and the other Central Powers. Palestine and the Middle East were regarded as highly strategic to the British Empire because of oil, and also because the Suez Canal controlled the sea route to India. 
The Middle East was now under the control of Britain's enemies. So Britain considered it vital to defeat the Turks and gain control for the Allies. In 1917, General Allenby and his troops advanced across southern Palestine. And in December, they captured Jerusalem. By the following year, all of Palestine had come under British control. Her troops were to remain there for the next 30 years. As the First World War came to an end, Britain and France issued a proclamation promising that former subjects of the Ottoman Empire would be able to determine their own futures. Briefly, freedom was in the air. However, a different reality lay behind the words. Long before the end of the war, the Allies had been planning who would control the Ottoman Empire when the Turks were defeated. These conflicting plans are often referred to as the contradictory promises. Firstly, in October 1915, Sir Henry McMahon, British High Commissioner in Egypt, had promised the Arabs in the person of Sheriff Hussein of Mecca that they could have an independent Arab state after the war if they would rise up against their overlords, the Turks. Believing that they were fighting for their freedom, some Arabs joined the Allied war effort and, assisted by Lawrence of Arabia, helped the Allies drive the Turks from their lands. However, for the last hundred years, there has been controversy over how McMahon's letter to Hussein should be interpreted. Did he implicitly include Palestine in the proposed independent Arab state, or did he not? Many Arabs and senior British figures have consistently maintained that Palestine was included, while British governments since 1920 have argued that it was excluded. But meanwhile, Britain had become party to two further wartime agreements, both of which seemed to contradict the undertaking to Hussein. In 1916, the secret Sykes-Picot agreement between Britain and France allocated what is now Syria and Lebanon to France and what is now Jordan and Iraq to Britain, whilst proposing to keep Palestine under international control. Then, a year later, Britain made yet another undertaking concerning Palestine. In November 1917, the British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour wrote to Lord Rothschild, a leader of the Jewish community, his Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. This promise became known as the Balfour Declaration. The idea that the Jewish people should be restored to the Holy Land so that biblical prophecies could be fulfilled, had been promoted by some Christians since the 1600s. Then, from the 1890s, the idea of Zionism began to take hold amongst some Jews, as Theodor Herzl argued that the Jewish people needed a political homeland of their own if they were to escape the horrific anti-Semitic persecution that was rife, particularly in Russia and Central Europe. By the early 1900s, Herzl's successor, Chaim Weizmann, saw Britain as the power with the global influence to make the Zionist goal a reality. So he set out to convince leading politicians that the Jewish people needed a homeland in Palestine, where they had deep spiritual and historical bonds. The Balfour Declaration was the result. Why did the war cabinet respond to Zionist pressure in this way? Foreign Secretary Balfour was one of the highly placed Christians in British society who believed that the Jewish people should be restored to the Holy Land. Prime Minister Lloyd George, who also came from a restorationist background, dreamt of putting Israel back on the map. Yet, at the same time, there were strategic calculations for issuing the Balfour Declaration. At this desperate point in the European conflict, the war cabinet hoped that the promise of a Jewish homeland would win the Allies the sympathies of Jews and their supporters worldwide. However, the British government did not consult the people then living in Palestine about its plans to create a Jewish homeland there. 90% of the population of Palestine were Arabs, who lived together with a small Jewish community. Palestine had been predominantly Arab in culture and language for many centuries. Yet, in private, Balfour wrote, In Palestine, we do not propose even to go through the form of consulting the wishes of the present inhabitants. The major powers were now committed to Zionism, which he described as being of far profounder import than the desires of the Arab inhabitants. 
The Balfour Declaration simply stated that the civil and religious rights of the non-Jewish population should not be prejudiced. So when the war came to an end, how would all these complex undertakings work out in practice? As the Western powers met in Paris to negotiate the peace settlement, Sharif Hussein sent his son Faisal to make sure Britain's promise of independence for the Arabs was not forgotten. But instead, the newly formed League of Nations handed control of Palestine to Britain. Under the terms of the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, Britain was required to implement the Balfour Declaration by supporting the creation of a Jewish national home and, at the same time, to prepare the people of Palestine for eventual self-government. The League of Nations stated that mandatory powers held a sacred trust to ensure the well-being and development of people in their care. What happened to the other areas that Sharif Hussein anticipated would gain independence? Transjordan, now Jordan, was made an autonomous emirate under Hussein's son, Abdullah. In the same way, the new kingdom of Iraq was given to his brother, Faisal. These were the rewards Hussein received for his loyalty to the British war effort, but they did not include Syria or Palestine. Angry Arab crowds soon massed in Jerusalem, denouncing the Balfour Declaration and demanding the self-determination that had been promised by Britain and France in 1918. Having made conflicting promises, Britain now had to face up to their consequences. She had created a contradiction. Just how unworkable this situation was, it took her 30 years to accept. Both communities, Jews and Arabs, believed they had been promised the land. As the Zionists swiftly began to implement their objectives, the Arabs were the first to conclude they had been deceived. Riots broke out in 1920. In 1921, there was even greater violence as Arabs attacked Jews and the British tried to regain order. After a period of relative calm, mutual suspicion between the Arab and Jewish communities flared up again in 1929 and rapidly escalated into mob violence with horrific consequences. 133 Jews and 116 Arabs were killed. Britain's response was slow and inadequate. Calm was finally restored by a show of British force. Meanwhile, the Jewish community was forging ahead under the umbrella of the British mandate, securing major economic concessions and establishing its own elected assembly and institutions of government. The Arab majority, on the other hand, felt left behind economically and politically. To be granted democratic representation, they were effectively required to accept the Balfour Declaration but the Arabs rejected this, fearing that a Jewish national home would lead to the creation of a Jewish state in their land. For their part, the British feared that an elected Arab majority would oppose Jewish demands for land and immigration. And so they held back the democratic progress they were supposed to foster under the mandate. Britain was upholding the first part of the declaration to establish a home for the Jewish people. But the second undertaking in the declaration, to protect the rights of the Arab population, proved to be hollow. Arab alarm grew still further in the 1930s when increasing numbers of Jews sought sanctuary in Palestine as the spectre of anti-Semitism grew in Nazi Germany. As more and more land passed into Jewish hands, the sense of Arab dispossession grew. By May 1936, Palestine was in open rebellion and it was not just Jewish communities who were being attacked, it was the British too. increasingly losing control. The British authorities resorted to ruthless methods to put down the revolt, including hangings, house demolitions, and the use of civilians as human shields. For a period, British and Jewish men fought the Arabs jointly in a counter-insurgency force known as the Special Night Squads. By 1939, the rebellion was suppressed leaving the Palestinian leadership weakened for years to come. To try to address the underlying deadlock between Arabs and Jews, London had responded with a succession of inquiries and commissions through the 1930s. Their dilemma was that any attempt to placate one community would provoke the anger of the other. At a loss for a solution, the Peel Commission of 1937 
proposed to partition Jews and Arabs into two states. But Arab opinion, led by the vehemently anti-Zionist Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Amin al-Husseini, denounced any idea of conceding territory to Jews as unthinkable. However, as Europe slid towards war, the British government changed course. The government white paper of 1939 abandoned partition and proposed that in 10 years, Palestine would become independent, representatively governed by Arabs and Jews. Controls were now put in place over how many Jews could immigrate to Palestine and how much land could pass into Jewish hands. For the first time, Arabs were to be given a say over Jewish immigration. The reason Neville Chamberlain's government swung in favor of Arab opinion at this point was the prospect of war. London feared that in a global conflict, the Arab world might turn against Britain, whilst the support of Jews would be guaranteed in view of their persecution by the Nazis. Jewish opinion immediately condemned the White Paper as an act of British betrayal and a retreat from the Balfour Declaration. There was fury that Jewish people would be restricted from finding sanctuary at their hour of greatest need. Nevertheless, Britain upheld the limits on Jewish immigration into Palestine right through the war. As refugees fleeing the Holocaust were arrested trying to enter Palestine, or were even sent back to Germany, as in the case of the Exodus, the Jewish community turned against Britain and the mandate. Sections of Jewish opinion became increasingly militant and violent, and Britain suffered heavy losses from terrorist atrocities. In February 1947, Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin stated that Britain was referring responsibility for the Palestinian problem to the United Nations. By September, as the situation continued to worsen, Britain announced that she would terminate her mandate for Palestine in May 1948. The UN solution to the Palestine problem was partition, but this was again rejected by the Arabs. As British forces beat an ungainly retreat, and the mandate came to an end. Partition was abandoned, leaving Jews and Arabs to an undeclared war for domination. On the 14th of May, 1948, Israel declared itself a state and was immediately recognized by America. The events of this time are known to some as the War of Independence and to others as the Nakba, or the Catastrophe, when about 60% of the Palestinian population became refugees as they fled or were expelled. Today's conflict between Israelis and Palestinians had begun. Britain's direct involvement in Palestine ended in 1948. But how should British people today respond to the story of Britain in Palestine? It's clear that this is a conflict that has no uh, resolution. It's just a conflict that is being managed, and the management uh, of wars, uh, of uh, attacks on civilians on both sides is what we're dealing with to this day. And then here's a, a really short video about what Henry, uh, Harry Truman was dealing with. Uh, I believe this is 1948. Go ahead. No sound. Okay. No. Okay. Well, these uh, videos are going to be made available. So if you go out, there's a QR code. You can download our, our Palestine Toolkit, and we'll make sure that you have these videos available to you uh, as well. Uh, next, I want to go <coughs> to a very special person for many reasons. One of the reasons why she's special is because she is a faculty member at Harvard Medical School and decided to fly in today for our forum. And she is also president of the Hassan Hattut uh, Foundation. And she's gonna speak about her father's journey and, and her journey in terms of Palestine. Dr. Ibat Hattut.
It was 1948 when Hassan Hathout, a Muslim Egyptian physician, had just graduated from medical school where he'd proposed to his future wife of 58 years. Rather than making their wedding date their priority, with my mother's agreement, my father volunteered to travel to care for the wounded in a war that had just emerged in a neighboring country called Palestine. There, he wrote daily memoirs, from which I shall translate two excerpts. I left Ramallah, he wrote, a beautiful city in Palestine. Yet I feel I still live there. My memories there are vivid until my very last minute. I departed, but to this day I feel here is there, as if Cairo is just a transit point in my life. My days in Ramallah were green, filled with white, bright memories as alive as can be. I feel them with all my heart and to the full extent of my capacity to love and beyond. If only time could go back. If only time could go back. In another excerpt, Hassan Hathou wrote, I had just packed my medical instruments to go to my assignment in the Palestinian city of Ramla, a town of history and civilization. I started reading about its people, how they were keen on education and progress when the phone suddenly rang. The British radio announced the news. City after city were falling. There was a denial, there was disbelief. Most people advised me not to go. Palestine had changed. It was under new foreign control. I was a medical doctor from Egypt, which was regarded as the enemy. I called the Red Crescent and told them I was going anyway. In communication with the Red Cross, I was designated as the physician in charge of the hospital of the city of Ramla. This audience may wonder why a new medical school graduate would delay his residency training and volunteer to help the wounded in a country that is not his own. And the answer to those who knew him is simple. Hassan Hathout always put his faith first. As Muslims, we happen to believe in a full chain of Abrahamic prophethood descending from one common God through Moses and his message of justice, through Jesus and his message of love, and through Muhammad with his message of mercy. Hassan Hathoud was a man of God before and after he became a doctor. He saw that many of the world's conflicts were born out of hatred. He practiced and preached love. For a devout Muslim, there is no land where the three Abrahamic religions are represented like they are in Palestine. There is no city where all three faiths are venerated like Jerusalem. That war came with a calling, and as Hassan Hathout frequently said, religion is a verb. As a Muslim and a physician, 
He was a firm believer in the sanctity of human life. In 1948, Dad went to Palestine to save lives. And now I'd like to share a story from my own childhood. My parents and I had gone to Austria for a summer vacation. Walking on the lake shore, we met and started a conversation with an elderly woman who told us she was an Israeli Jew. My father mentioned that he was an Egyptian Muslim and that he'd been a doctor in the 1948 war over Palestine. They exchanged names and addresses and said goodbye. Months later, my father received a letter relating to an incident that had happened 20 years earlier during his days in Palestine. While stationed in Ramla, my father had received a captured Israeli soldier who was shot with a bullet in his chest. A group of Palestinians who had just lost their homes, their loved ones, and their homeland walked in to attack the Israeli soldier. My father stood in front of him and told the group over my dead body. He recited the words of the Quran, the same words found in the Jewish scripture, the Talmud. Whoever saves a life, it is as though they saved all humankind. He reminded them of the rights of the prisoners of war in Islam. The crowd left in peace. My father tended to the injured Israeli soldier as his patient, removed the bullet from his chest, took care of him for weeks, listened to him talk about his wife and young son. Days passed and the Israeli soldier fully recovered. Dad called the Red Cross, who picked him up and transported him back to his army. The first news my father received of this man afterwards came 20 years later. It was that letter. Somehow, the man got our address from the Jewish lady we'd met in Austria. The essence of his letter was gratitude for having saved his life and an invitation to visit him in his newly established country. An invitation which my father politely declined. My father responded that he was happy to know that his former patient was alive and healthy and he asked him about his son. At the same time, my father declined the invitation to visit, explaining that he could not do so when Palestinians had suffered so much injustice. Make no mistake, my father, though able to cherish the sanctity and humanity of all souls, including Jewish and Israeli souls, was also firm in his belief that grave injustice was being perpetrated against the Palestinians, and he never ceased believing so. In fact, the reason why I never learned my mother's delicious Egyptian cookie recipe was because my father would not let her bake them anymore out of his grief over Palestine. Palestine has been lost, he'd say in Arabic, and you want us to eat cookies? A few years later, my father received a second letter 
The first half was written by the same former Israeli soldier, extending niceties and another invitation for my father to visit. Then the writing was interrupted. New handwriting began. It was this man's wife who wrote, my husband had a heart attack and died. I found this letter in his belongings. I wanted to thank you for giving him 25 years of happy life with our son and family. On one level, my father and this man were ideologic enemies. On another, they were two men who were able to transcend their differences through a common humanity. The same humanity that brought my Muslim father, Hassan Hathout, with Rabbi Leonard Bierman in the 1980s to become a force for peace. They first met in California at a time of particular unrest taking place in Jerusalem and the West Bank. My father loved Leonard Bierman. When someone pointed out, you do know he is Jewish, <laughs> and my father replied, yes, I love his love of humanity. One of the other things the two men had in common was the courage to critique their own people. In the early 90s, my father had open heart surgery. As soon as I heard that the operation was over and he was out of the OR, I rushed to the hospital thinking I'd be the first to visit him. But I was not. When I pushed the elevator button, the door opened and Rabbi Bierman appeared smiling and gave me directions to dad's room. <laughs> he had visited him before me. I later asked myself why Rabbi Bierman went to my father's bedside in the first place and so soon after his surgery. And I concluded that there must be a special bond between those who attain a certain closeness to God that brings them together and enables them to rise, to shed off worldly labels and become closer to a common source of light. Such that a Muslim like Hassan Hathout worked with Rabbi Leonard Bierman in this very church together with Reverend George Regas for the need to reverse the arms race, to call for the end of war, all war. They were a triangle of light that expanded to include my uncle Maher Hathout, the Reverend Ed Bacon, our Reverend Mike Kinman, Laila and Salam al Mariati, and many others who believe and fight for a better humanity, a humanity that allows people to feel the pain of others whether or not they agree with their ideologies, a humanity that yearns to protect the lives of innocent children, women and men, regardless of the color of their flag. Ladies and gentlemen, the wars we are witnessing today are not only a monumental failure of diplomacy, but a devastating crisis of humanity. There is so much to grieve and so much to pray for. People of faith, are particularly saddened at the degree of misinterpretation, misrepresentation, and weaponization of their religions. So much so 
that Rabbi Leonard Bierman devoted his very last temple sermon to reprimanding the killing of Palestinian children by some of his own people, telling them, somewhere on the road, we lost our moral compass. I remember when I was a child sitting on my father's lap, watching the first Apollo moon landing. And I recall my father saying, isn't it a pity that man who was able to reach the moon is still not able to reach the heart of his fellow man. While we cannot cure the world, we can certainly do our part where we are with what we have, like the old story of the man who walked on the beach, rescuing one starfish at a time by tossing it from the sand back to the ocean so it can live. When someone told him, there are hundreds of beaches with thousands of starfish. You won't make a difference, he replied as he tossed another starfish back into the ocean. I make a difference to this one. For the past two months, many of us have been in deep grief hidden grief, perpetual grief. We learned how to shed silent tears as we watch a sad circus around us and a fractured humanity bleed. We ask God why. We pray and realize God must have a plan for each of us. Today, we speak as Muslims in a church whose friendship we treasure. Once again, we extend our hands and open our hearts to all who are willing to work for a just peace, to endure the uncomfortable conversations, to resist mountains of hatred, and to make a difference wherever we can. I shall end with Hassan Hatout's words. Friends in faith rise while you still have a choice on the wings of love soar above and sing with your hearts, not only your voice. God is love, God is love, God is love. Thank you about for that powerful storytelling and really raising some of our religious principles uh, and challenging each and every one of us to keep those principles at the forefront uh, in the decisions that we make uh, towards this conflict. And I think as you eloquently uh, depicted, Dr. Hassan had to kept those religious principles at the forefront. Uh, and we hope that we can all do the same. And, Likewise, as with Le Rabbi Leonard Bierman and, and Reverend George Regas and, and everyone involved in, in this uh, church. Uh, next, uh, we want to turn to uh, a person who has a very difficult job. Um, she, is, uh, she was on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and had to join John Bolton and Elliot Abrams for such a commission. Uh, but she also has an easy job. She happens to be my wife. So, that's, but that's not why she's speaking. She's speaking because she has an important uh, story to tell as well in terms of her tenure as a commissioner appointed by President uh, Bill Clinton back in the 90s and a visit to Jerusalem and some observations uh, as it relates to the current conflict. Her, her father, who passed away in 2000, uh, was from Khan Yunus, and her family has already lost over 50 members. Uh, so it takes a lot for Leila to come and, and speak, so we just appreciate the time that she's able to spend with all of us. Please welcome Dr. Leila Almariaga.
Thank you so much. It's great to be here at All Saints, where I feel, always feel welcome and among friends um, uh, and supporters and solidarity. I, I thought you were going to say the harder job was being mar married to you. <laughs> That has been, you know, speaking of having that solidarity and support, especially at a time in my life when I was asked to serve on this Commission on International Religious Freedom. Some of you may recall events around that time, and, and uh, I wanted to just share my experience. And listening to the, the other speakers, the relevance of some of these other issues related to the role of uh, Israel, Palestine, in these uh, visions of restoration, if you will, dispensationalism and so forth, all also played out in the United States in the formation of this commission and in the establishment of the International Religious Freedom Act. <clears throat> this also occurred at a very challenging time in my life. Um, as Salam mentioned, uh, my father passed away in 2000, very unexpectedly. It was the same year we gave birth to our third child. And all throughout this, I was uh, practicing medicine as an OBGYN, uh, and then uh, was called to serve on this commission. And in the legacy of the Hattuts, the late Dr. Hassan, Dr. Maher, we were basically told uh, uh, as their um, mentees, we never had the right of refusal when we were asked to serve, because we were, this was what we were called to do. So it was a very challenging time for me personally. And, just telling you about my experience, you'll probably understand why as well. So in 1998, the International Religious Freedom Act was enacted to elevate religious freedom as a higher priority in U.S. foreign policy. Um, and this is according to the USCIRF, Commission on International Religious Freedom website, focused on promoting religious freedom as recognized in international law, particularly as enshrined in the UN Declaration for Human Rights. Central to this act was the establishment of the Commission on International Religious Freedom and the appointment of a special ambassador out of the State Department for International Religious Freedom. This commission was tasked with issuing an annual report to the State Department uh, with particular focus on countries that were in greater violation of religious freedom issues. This was intended to be bipartisan, so this was determined based on who who appointed each commissioner. So I was appointed by President Clinton uh, to serve on the very first commission. Other members were appointed by members of Congress and so forth. Um, but it should be said that the major impetus for the whole Religious Freedom Restri uh, Act, as well as international religious freedom, was really driven by the Christian right and their allies at the time, whose main focus was really on the treatment of Christians in different countries, especially at the time in South Sudan, who were subjected to abuse, including allegations of slavery at the hands of the leaders in the, quote, Arab and Muslim North. And this context of us versus them, them being the evil Muslims who were enacting Sharia that suppressed people of all other faiths, was a lot of the background of many of the meetings that we had as part of this commission. Those who promoted it in the beginning were people like uh, Frank Wolf and Sam Brownbeck, uh, as well as Michael Horowitz from the Hudson Institute. Um, <clears throat> the other areas that were focused on uh, uh, got a lot of attention related to the treatment of religious minorities in former Soviet republics and former communist areas of Southeast Asia, with particular attention on China. But at the time, the other commissioners of this very first commission included Elliot Abrams, John Bolton. I didn't really know much about either of them until that uh, experience. Um, Archbishop Theodore McCarrick, Farouz Kazimzadeh, who was uh, with the Baha'i community, David Saperstein, uh, uh, representing uh, the Jewish community, and others, but this was, uh, I was much younger than I am now, quite naive, and I thought we were all on the side of promoting religious freedom and human rights for everybody, all the time, everywhere. That was not the case. Um, as I mentioned, there was constant reference to the Sharia, or Islamic law, without any knowledge thereof, and without even curiosity to know what that actually meant. So even when I uh, thought that it would be a good idea to have a, 
an in-service, if you will, with the commissioners about what Sharia actually is and how you can't use such sweeping generalizations for such a huge concept. It was met with the, the question of why. Um, and truly there was ignorance among the commissioners, but, but I was successful in inviting <clears throat> John Esposito to give us a presentation because all of the meetings took place in Washington. But the, at the time, Elliot Abrams was the chair of this commission and he felt, well, we need the alternative view. And so he insisted on having Bernard Lewis basically give the, uh, the opposing view uh, or a different view of what Sharia was. As if we can't, as Muslims, just speak for ourselves and have whatever we choose for our representation. But that was the kind of atmosphere um, that was at play with this commission. Um, part of what they did was hold conferences and go on fact-finding trips, one of which involved the Middle East. And so I ended up, this was, like I said, a very challenging time for me, um, but I, I ended up submitting a paper to the, uh, the Center for Policy Analysis on Palestine. I'm going to just read some excerpts from that because it summarized what happened, and it also shows us how nothing really has changed in, in this time. <clears throat> so until the fall of 2000, Israel was not on the commission's agenda at all. Uh, my attempts to highlight numerous religious freedom violations that occurred in Israel and the occupied territories were unconvincing to other members. As I, uh, There were no criteria for which countries to choose, which countries to focus on. It was really at the interest of each commission member, which was one of the flaws of the commission at the time. Finally, the eruption of the Al-Aqsa Intifada in response to Ariel Sharon's visit to the Haram al-Sharif prompted the commission to issue a letter to Secretary of State Madeleine Albright urging the government to denounce attacks on holy places uh, and restore access to religious sites but when legitimate security interests are met. So buying into this notion of every act of violence is, sub is justified by security concerns. Um, any attempts to blame, uh, to place blame on Sharon's provocative visit were quickly thwarted and the commission refused to criticize Israel's use of collective punishment, which bars thousands of Palestinian Christians and Muslims from reaching their houses of worship in Jerusalem. This is ongoing until today. And the importance of this also is for those who are just new coming into this conflict with the events of October the 7th, this was all written over 20 years ago, so it, it is its own moment in history, but it is relevant to what's happening today because this situation has only gotten worse. Um, the, the commission eventually decided to plan a trip to the Middle East because they really wanted to go to Egypt to talk about this, the conditions of Coptic Christians in Egypt and to Saudi Arabia to basically talk about the circumstances for any religious group in Saudi Arabia that was not Muslim. Um, and I suggested that that trip should include a visit to Israel, particularly in view of growing anti-US sentiment in the region that would intensify in response to an official delegation condemning religious freedom abuses in Egypt and Saudi Arabia while ignoring Israel at such a critical time, thus confirming long-held perceptions of a double standard that consistently favors Israel. So several commissioners were in disagreement as to whether we should even go to Israel. Elliot Abrams refused to participate in that part of the trip. He went to Egypt and Saudi Arabia instead. Um, and they also wanted to just, at the end, have only comment on our findings in Egypt and Saudi Arabia without addressing Israel because we couldn't come to an agreement on our findings. Um, and I argued to do so would be disingenuous, making the trip to Israel serve as a fig leaf that would lend legitimacy to the Middle East trip while avoiding any criticism of the most well-established sacred cow in Washington. Ultimately, the commission used such an escape route. The detailed findings of the trips to all three countries were confined to internal documents, not accessible to the public, but they did issue public statements with recommendations regarding religious freedom in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and did not issue any remarks about Israel and the occupied territory because, quote, it sees its study of the situation is a complex matter requiring additional work, as per Elliot Abrams in his testimony to the House International Relations Committee. So as I said, <clears throat> this was in, my father died in 2000, my daughter was born that year. In 2001, we went on this trip to Palestine 
And I was in the mosque, the Dome of the Rock, of which we saw pictures, and I had a, it, actually my first emotional breakdown since my father had passed away, feeling that this was the reason I was there. He died believing in everything in Palestine, whatever it was, however it was going to come to be, even if everyone else objected to Oslo, if that meant he could go back to Gaza and start to reestablish the airport there or build clinics there, he would do whatever it took. Um, but he died suddenly, um, and so I felt like this was a sign that I needed to continue. But <clears throat> the, this was the weeks before my term was about to end, and the team, Elliot Abrams and everyone on the commission knew that if they didn't issue a statement, it would be too late for me to issue my own. So I knew that and prepared a dissent. Um, and I talked about the religious freedom violations that occurred in Israel, such as the con in Israel, the control of the, by the Orthodox rabbinate over most religious affairs, marriage, conversion, burial, circumcision, resulted in serious discrimination uh, against non-Orthodox Jews and non-Orthodox religious groups, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian received only two to four percent of the religious affairs budget for maintenance and restoration of houses of worship, religious services, educational programs. Palestinian Christians and Muslims face widespread and systematic discrimination throughout Israel with respect to property ownership, education, employment, and government representation. The law of return, which grants automatic citizenship to anyone of Jewish heritage, which is loosely defined, is inherently discriminatory on the basis of religious identity. In East Jerusalem and the remainder of the occupied territories, discrimination against the non-Jewish population compared to the treatment of Jewish settlers is most egregious in terms of distribution <clears throat> of resources, allocation of social services, law enforcement, protection afforded, by security personnel. This is in 2001 I wrote this. Hopefully you all have been paying attention to the news and see that this is ongoing and worse today. House demolitions and Jewish occupation of Palestinian, Christian, and Muslim sections of Jerusalem result in a form of ethnic cleansing designed to rid the city of its non-Jewish population. <clears throat> in addition, the ongoing siege throughout the territories impedes the right to worship in Jerusalem and elsewhere such as Hebron while Jews continue to have unfettered access to holy sites in the same areas. Finally, while assaults on houses of worship of all faiths have increased, of particular concern are the attacks by Israeli security forces against religious sites, such as mosques in the occupied territories, in contravention of international law and without any official condemnation. <clears throat> the full text of my dissent was, was on the website up until a point. I'm not sure if it's still there. Uh, but I felt that it was very important to document those things for the record, especially because we had traveled there. <clears throat> but there was not consensus to be even to be able to, to, to issue this statement and this report. Um, and so <clears throat> I felt very strongly that I had to at least get this word out in other ways. But I sort of conclude my thoughts by saying that um, you know the blatant and willful ignorance of Israel's human rights abuses permeates all levels of government. The choice of, the commission, of, of this commission to, uh, to do the same served to undermine its credibility and, uh, at home and abroad where our tax dollars finance these endeavors. The <clears throat> many activists at the time within the human rights community viewed the international religious freedom movement with skepticism uh, resisting efforts to create a hierarchy of human rights that emphasizes religious persecution, however it is defined, at the expense of other equally serious human rights violations. But, but as I wrote here, this movement is here to stay. It's now been 25 years since the establishment of the commission. And I wrote, therefore, those who care about religious freedom for Palestinian Christians and Muslims should continue to apply pressure so that appropriate attention is given to the suffering of thousands that is at least on par with, if not exceeding, that which has been addressed by that commission elsewhere at the time. Um, this was a very hard experience for me, just as I said, trying to balance so many things plus dealing with my overall emotional state. But I felt at the time, given that there was very little access of Muslims in government at the time, that I had no no alternative but to do the best I could to represent our interest. 
and I felt that my role was to, to highlight religious persecution of Muslims, including Muslims who live in Muslim countries, because there was this assumption that if you were Muslim and you lived in a country that controlled every aspect of religious life, that somehow you weren't persecuted, whether that was in Iran or Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> to provide objective information about Islam and Muslims, since there was and still is a desire to paint Muslim culture, civilization, governance, religion uh, with one brush and to oversimplify who we are as a, as a people, as a community. And to point out the double standards when it came to calling out human rights abuses of some places and not others. So I hope, and you know, my commitment was to fulfill that, which I hope that I did. Um, but it's very sad and distressing to see that I could have just written this today and it would still be relevant, which shows the fact that there really hasn't been traction within our own government to make a difference when it comes to religious freedom, religious persecution, and treatment of others um, because of how we are afraid to address some of the issues that are happening in Israel. But right now, a genocide is happening you can't call it by anything else. Over 1% of the population of Gaza has been killed. That's not counting the people buried under the rubble. This is not the time for us to mince words, to be evasive, to, to be sort of apologetic. This is happening on our watch. Just had news, six more people from my family, including five children, were killed in, a, in an attack on a house in Rafah because that's where they fled to. They didn't do anything wrong. So this is extreme collective punishment, the use of disproportionate excessive force, all of which are against international law. And if, it, if this isn't enough to get people to say something, to demand a ceasefire, to, to end this once and for all, this subjugation and dehumanization of the Palestinian people, I don't know what is. But what happened in, in you know, 20 years ago was a moment in history that I felt was important at the time. Did it prepare me for this? I don't think so. I, I'm, I'm at a loss, but I'm appealing to all of you and to the people you know to have courage, like the people of Gaza have shown incredible courage. They have shown faith because they don't understand what's happened to them, so they're putting their faith and their trust in God because they don't know what else to do. But we have tremendous privileges here right now by, by being in this kind of uh, setting, and so I really ask you to use that privileges, privilege and to, to stand up and, and show courage, even if it's not, if it makes you feel uncomfortable. So that's what I would leave you with, and I want to thank you for the chance to be here today. Thank you. Um, this is our question and answer period, but we're out of time. Uh, so I, I can ask one or two questions, or we can continue this over Zoom later on in the week. Uh, why, don't, why don't we just ask one question and then... We don't, we don't need the space for a while, so if we want to go a little longer... <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I just received word from a higher authority that we can, <laughs> we, we can keep going. Okay, we'll just start real quick. Uh, First question to Munir. When were Jews brought back to Jerusalem by, uh, when the Muslims uh, took over uh, political authority? Thank you for that question. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, no, no. Oh, you can't hear me? You turn it on. Here, use this. All right. So, you know, we were talking about the time of the early caliphate, and once Omar established control of the city, Essentially, it became open to anybody who wanted to come there for whatever reasons, whether for religious purposes or for trade uh, or for visiting, you know, uh, people that they knew in the area. Uh, obviously, in the early period, you know, it's a limited amount of people. But as time went on, more and more uh, members of the Jewish community in particular who were living in other parts of the Mediterranean world were able to come back and uh, visit uh, the holy site, you know, the, the wall in particular that was still there from uh, Herod's time uh, for worship and uh, to engage in commerce. So the Mediterranean world became uh, a significant arena for Jewish trade. We have evidence of that from the uh, uh, 
uh, the repository in Egypt um, where many, many documents about uh, commerce uh, are present. So that gives us an insight into the vibrancy of the Jewish experience in, in that time period in the Middle Ages, uh, except, of course, when conflicts arose, especially with the Crusaders and the Mongols and others who came and disrupted sort of the baseline uh, multicultural, multi-religious experience that was uh, eminent in, in the time. And Tifayaz, uh, did life for average people living in Jerusalem change significantly under Ottoman rule? From the, uh, from an earlier period? Yes. Uh, well, um, uh, yeah. yeah, it is. Um, the uh, life did not change that significantly uh, during the Ottoman uh, control uh, because, uh, you know, it, it, Palestine was ruled from places that were far out, whether from Damascus, Baghdad, uh, Egypt, and so there's a certain uh, element of autonomy uh, that the people had left. Of course, they were subject to the larger, uh, you know, regional and global dynamics, but by and large, uh, you know, the, uh, who was actually the sovereign did not have a direct or major impact on the lives and daily routine of people's lives. Uh, there was, you know, the, the um, family ties, tribal connections, uh, belonged to the townships and so forth. That was the dominant uh, theme uh, of people uh, in Palestine. And even uh, for non-Muslims, uh, you know, under uh, Ottoman rule and control uh, outside of the Middle East, there was little direct influence and impact uh, that the subjects of the Ottomans had felt, uh, except when it comes, of course, you know, to conscription during war and taxes and so forth, and that varied over the ages and decades. Thank you. Um, there's a, a comment. Can you clarify that Muslims are not the only people that are being killed? Christians are too, and that is absolutely correct. Uh, and there are churches that are being bombed as well in many of the hospitals run by Christian organizations. In fact, I saw a video where uh, a Muslim went to a Christian priest in Gaza. He says, well, if, if our imam is killed uh, and there's nobody to call the prayer at our mosque, would you call the prayer for the mosque? And the Christian priest answered, yes, I'll make the call to prayer for the mosque. So it's that kind of solidarity between Muslims and Christians and, and really all, uh, people of all backgrounds there. Um, and then here's a general question for everybody. Uh, where is it? Uh, not there. There, there was a question about, uh, okay, here it is. How much of the historic tolerance and protection of other groups continues and has authority in Islamic decision makers today? And I will give you a short answer. There are no Islamic leaders in Muslim countries. Uh, unfortunately, most of the countries are represented by authoritarian ruler, rulers, whether it's military dictatorship in Egypt or a monarchy in Saudi Arabia. Um, much of it is remnants of the Belfort uh, and Sykes-Picot agreements. So we, we don't have that uh, authentic Islamic representation among the governments uh, in the Middle East. But I'll let other people elaborate on that if you want to talk about religious freedom. I think this is also related to protection of other groups. Yeah. I mean, if you visit a variety of Muslim-majority countries, you will find that there are churches and synagogues and, and you know, Hindu temples and Buddhist temples in different countries, it varies from country to country. All of these countries are going through their own internal dynamics. Often there's ethnic hierarchies and things of that sort, but there's a generally, um, in most cases, I would say, some religious freedom that's evident now. The populations of people who it, practice these other faiths are much smaller than the majority Muslim population, but in places like Malaysia, it's, it's a bit more mixed, uh, and you can see that. It's uh, evident in Bosnia and evident in many other countries. So. It's hard to make a universal statement, but I would just say that from an Islamic perspective, at least an authentic religious perspective, there has to be a, a, a fundamental respect for uh, freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. Here's another I general would, question. I'll just 
Yeah, because I, you know, it come, it, it really brings up this point of, it really depends on where you are. And in any given country, in any given place, and to, to be able to say what happens in Afghanistan is the same as what happens in Sudan, is the same as what happens in Indonesia or Pakistan. It's, it's, it's really oversimplifying the whole picture. And each country and setting uh, has its own uh, circumstances that need to be understood. So I just caution against, again, paint, using that broad brush to say Islamic countries, this is what happens to people when it's really very different under very different circumstances. So it really depends on where you are. And that was a lot of what I had to do with this in the, within the commission was to say, well, let's talk about Iran, we'll talk about that. We can talk about Afghanistan separately and distinctly to what's happening there. And that to try to really, because they would try to use sweeping language blaming Islam and Sharia in general everywhere for all of the problems. Uh, and especially bringing to the point that in many of these places where uh, other people are persecuted, Muslims themselves are persecuted as well. Yeah. So I think that's an important thing to keep yeah, in mind. Yeah, and I also find it ironic that they keep trying to blame Sharia or Jihad for the conflict when you have Israeli government leaders saying the reason why they're doing what they're doing, they point to the Bible. And they say that that's, you know, the, here's my deed to this land. And so if there is an exploitation of religion, uh, I, I think we, we have to be fair and, and criticize that as well. Um, uh, to you, uh, Dr. Ibat, uh, the situation is dire. What gives you hope? Yes, it works. Nothing lasts forever. And the mightiest civilizations uh, have uh, gone through ups and downs. Uh, so in terms of oppression uh, and injustice, uh, it is the natural course uh, of humanity to move towards uh, obliterating it. Uh, the question is, uh, can we do it now? And if not now, when? Thank you. Um, why hasn't the Arab Islamic world united in word or deed to fight this genocide? Okay. The, the answers are coming from here, what? Not, not there. Go ahead. Well, uh, that's a, a difficult and easy question at the same time. Um, you know, there's the, uh, the, uh, the international system where um, countries, uh, since uh, Sykes-Picot and the division of the Arab East uh, and the uh, introduction of the international uh, state, uh, nation-state system to the Middle East, uh, left countries uh, uh, concerned first and foremost about their own so-called local national interests. Uh, and uh, the, the great powers have succeeded at codifying such a framework uh, and uh, in the 20th series and 40s and after the second war, the countries emerged each vying for its own domestic local interests. Uh, and even the uh, um, regional organizations, the Arab League for example, it was formed uh, within this understood framework by Britain uh, first and foremost that countries will be first uh, concerned about their affairs. Uh, even the Islamic, you know, the Conference of Islamic States is, was uh, encouraged, its creation was encouraged by the United States in the context of the Cold War uh, and uh, calculations of strategic importance. So, uh, so this is the background of the unwillingness, inability of these Arab or Muslim states to intervene. And of course you have the neighboring countries uh, are bound by uh, the, for example, in the cases of Egypt and Jordan with the peace treaties that they signed with Israel uh, and Lebanon, of course, with Hezbollah and so forth with limited uh, and complicated uh, intervention. And then, of course, the Abrahamic uh, Accords that we have experienced under the Trump uh, administration and which was uh, very welcome very warmly with the current administration and the talk about 
the Israeli-Saudi normalization. In that context, uh, you don't see any uh, uh, rationale from the perspective of these countries to intervene, uh, genocide or not. Thank you. Um, I think we're out of time. Uh, I just want to give opportunity for anybody to give closing, closing remarks. One, one quick one. Um, you know, a couple of things. I think it always needs to be distinguished between uh, the sovereign power of a territory and the fate of the civil, civilian, civilian population in it. Uh, looking at, uh, taking a quick look at, for example, the history of Palestine and the powers that have uh, ruled uh, the territory, just a very quick reading. You have the Canaanites, Egypt, the Hiscus, Egypt, the Hittites, uh, the Canaanites, the Jews, the Philistines, the Babylon, the Babel, 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 Babylonia, sorry, Pre, you know, Persia, Greece, Egyptian, uh, Selkidiots, uh, and uh, Persian, Rome, Arab, Fatimites, Turks, Sanjiks, um, Great Britain, Jews, and so forth. So sovereigns, uh, sovereign powers come and go. It is the conduct of these sovereign uh, conquests vis-a-vis -vis the population that of utmost concern. Are you going to you know, kill the population that you, for you know, strategic political reasons, you have come to rule over? Or are you going to expel them? This is the constant factor that we always demand, in, irrespective of who the sovereign power of a population. The fundamental fact is what happens to the civilian population under that power. And we've seen here the demonstration, there is a, a stark and a clear difference uh, between, for example, the, you know, the current Muslim era and the crusade and whether Israeli forces occupied Jerusalem in 1907, within the first few hours cleared, uh, evacuated 130 families from what was called the Moroccan Quarter to clear uh, the, to make space for the uh, Wailing Wall Plaza. Uh, these uh, actions are what at the core of the issue. Thank you. I see, uh, again, the issue in a non-political lens as one of lack of love, but also I want to highlight that the three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, are very uh, similar, and what we need is from religious leaderships in the three religions to help Muslims become better Muslims, Christians become better Christians, and Jews become better Jews. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We will try to continue the conversation over Zoom uh, at a later date because we have so many questions that we weren't able to get to, but we really appreciate uh, your time and spending with us on this important conversation and teaching. And we believe that these narratives uh, and, and historical foundations are important for us to achieve peace. Uh, we cannot achieve peace by a single narrative. Uh, it's, it's something that requires us to really actually push that so that we avoid a regional war or, God forbid, uh, a third world war uh, or somebody deciding to use nuclear bombs uh, in the future. It's already enough devastation We'd like it to stop, and we ask all of you to continue in your courageous efforts calling for a ceasefire and a political resolution to this conflict because there is no military solution to this conflict. Thank you very much.